right. So um, I suppose a little bit about us before we start. Um, I think uh, I'm hoping most of the 11 plus journey know uh, me and um, I, yeah, I'm John and Zoe Smith. I run the Education Hotel. Um, I'm often in here doing things like wild words. Um, I'm a three times Oxford grad, uh, run an education consultancy, and I coach students for top scholarships and top schools. So things like King Scholarship, Wickham Abbey Scholarship, Westminster Challenge, um, focusing on, on some of those top schools. Um, I also help students with, with Oxbridge Prep. However, I am absolutely delighted because I have real expert with me today i've got a fraser here and um yeah I'm, and i'm quite excited to do this uh do this live because um yeah because i'm i'm excited to hear what you've got to say so go ahead and introduce yourself to us oh you've already given me a lovely introduction so um in my day job i'm actually a gp and medical doctor and i do this kind of a side hobby um interest developed as i was interviewing university students for mbbs um, some Russell Group universities so I got into interviewing had some official training and then my children about seven years ago started 11 plus journey so friends and family would ask me about doing 11 plus interviews and it really took on from there so um, and I, I just love doing it at the moment also in my spare time I'm a school governor for independent prep schools so I've links with various schools uh, mindfulness coach written some books and the hardest job of all is I'm a mother to three boys um, so yeah, that, that's me in a nutshell. Perfect. And am I right in thinking that one of them is just wrapping up in terms of yeah. 11 plus now? Yeah, so I had an elder one who did the GCSEs the what year that he didn't do the GCSEs. And I had a younger one who has just finished 11 plus. So oh, I've had enough grey hair. <laughs> I sympathise with every parent out there. <laughs> so they're all done. They're all finished as all of this done. year. <laughs> I'm medical school training doing 11 plus you can see the stress I'm just coming down so yeah yeah it was hard <laughs> <laughs> perfect all right so hopefully you you are you're ready and primed to offer our guys um lots of tips about yeah. about really what the point of these interviews are I know some people have have had these interviews kind of very quickly thrust upon them yeah. Um, some schools have decided to put interviews in instead of tests. Yeah. Some have decided, obviously, they come alongside tests as they normally do. Um, and, and some have decided to increase the amount of interviews that they're doing. So, um, yeah, so I suppose let's start with, yeah, what, what is the interview all about? What's the point of it? OK, so the interview is two parts. Obviously, there's you, the interviewee, and then there's the school, the interviewer. And it's really to find a fit. I call it like a marriage or pieces of a puzzle. They want to know if the two pieces will fit. And it really is that simple. So they're gonna use various components. So they'll use the written exam, they'll use the headmaster's reference. And then, which I say is the icing on the cake, the interview process, which is usually the last process. Now in Corona, that icing on the cake actually might be a bit thicker. It might have more importance because some of the written exams were canceled. So, it's a little bit of a different time at the moment. So one of the things they're going to look for in the interview is how will you fit? How will your child fit into this school? They're going to imagine how is that child going to be in the classroom? Are they going to be disruptive? Are they going to be able to take on new ideas? Are they going to work within the team? Are they going to be able to lead? How do they think? Are they teachable? And these are all things they're going to dig out in the interview. They're also going to really weed out those children who they think have been overly prepped and that could be in the interview as well so we do always say don't over rehearse the interview process and I get clients who come to me and they might be members of Lambda and they've got sheets and sheets of sentences that they've rehearsed and I have to unrehearse them yep. because you're not doing your child justice if you're not showing the true your true child your true personality and I think one of the things about that is that you have to think you're good enough. OK, so one of the things that I do work on is confidence. I think an 11 plus journey is quite draining for the child. And sometimes they're left with a tiny little bit of confidence after everything they've been through. So part of the process is to build up that confidence and to say to them, look, you don't have to be a, a, an you know, Olympic gymnast. You don't have to be grade eight piano, even if you are grade two or something that's good enough. 
So we don't make up answers. We literally just bring out the best of you. What have you done in a typical day? So one of the things that I like to tell my clients to do is to do a diary and just say, what did you do in the morning? What did you do in the afternoon? And then use that as a mind map. And again, we're not putting words in their mouths. We're just bringing out what you do normally. Exactly. Could be, you know, you know, monopoly, anything. Lots can be inferred from those kind of things. So part of it is to show what you do in your spare time. Um, we also need to know from the school's point of view, are they going to struggle? And I think some of that is through the written exam. So, you know, are you at a certain academic level? They also want to look at this thing called resilience, which is a really big word. And I don't want the kids to get bogged down in resilience and perseverance and all these kind of things. But just know if you're faced with a difficult moment, how would you bounce back? How would you react to that? So these are things, again, that might come up in the interview. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. They also want to know, have you been forced to try and say to the interviewer that you want to come to the school when really you don't? So that's a common question that comes up. Do you really want to come to this school? Are you really enthusiastic? And that again will be something that's asked. They also want to know how you interact with adults. So that will come in the interview process. And being an online interview, I'm going to talk about this a little bit, the ball it really is in your court when you do an online interview. As an interviewer, we're actually a little bit in the dark and that works to your advantage. And I'll talk about that later boarding school I don't know if Gemma you want to talk about the boarding school yeah sure and um, so I suppose on on the edge of of what you said I I definitely get parents who who have worked through answers with their children their children often can can get to the point of sounding robotic mm -hmm. um and I know we talked before about about over coaching and what I say to to parents who are worried about oh are they going to be under prepared I say well if if they're over prepared, they're likely to give them tougher questions because they haven't prepared those ones. So, yeah. so that's just a, a kind of a moment that I thought was was probably worth worth sharing. But yeah, for boarding school, if you are if you're looking to enter a boarding school when you're 13, you may well be interviewed a year or so beforehand. Uh, it seems almost, almost a bit a bit paradoxical because you're not planning on not planning on actually entering, but um, what they want to do is they want to get a feel for you as a person, your personality and um, and how you are maturing. So if you're looking at 13 plus, but you've taken something like a pretest, there may also be a an interview in there. There's also scholarship interviews. Um, so I know that there are um, I've been chatting recently with a couple of um, a couple of parents whose children are going through academic scholarship interviews at the moment as well. So those are for either 11 plus or, or 13 plus entries. Um, with boarding school, you're more likely to get something like a group interview because they want to make sure that you can work well with others to see what it would be like living in, in that type of school, which again, you may have questions around about any worries that you have or about the um, how, you've, how you've really spent your time away from home. Have you ever lived away from home? It doesn't matter if you haven't, but um, being able to show that you've thought about those things um, and that you've considered them. All right. Oh. There we are. All right, so how does an online interview differ? Right, I think actually, like I said, with an online interview, if I was the parent, I would be ecstatic, okay? So let me talk about this a little bit more. As an interviewer, I just finished some interviews for George's Medical School last year. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they get the candidate, they flash up their questions and the candidate responds and they video it. And then they send the video to me later on in the evening and I mark it. I have zero interaction with that candidate. In the same way, let's, uh, I'm talking about my day job as a doctor. So when a patient comes in and they come to my room and they're panting away and they're really breathless, I've kind of in my head thinking, wow, why are they breathless? Something's wrong here. If a patient comes into my room and they smell, you know, they haven't had a shower for three days. Again, I might be thinking about depression, whether they're anxious, or if a patient comes into my room and they've got four or five bags of shopping and then they talk about back pain, I'm like, hmm, they haven't really got back pain. <laughs> so before they've even opened their mouth, I've made a judgment. Okay, I've got certain cues and we call those non-verbal cues. With an online interview, I don't have that. And that actually works in your favor. 
It works against the interviewer, but it works for the interviewee. So, for example, if you're nervous right now, I'm kind of twiddling my fingers a bit. Um, I'm kind of kicking my legs under the desk. <laughs> you cannot tell, right? If you've got a nervous child, this is perfect for you. Online interviews are great. You can have a stress ball. So you know all those squidgy balls, you can have that under the desk. You can be doing that if you're nervous. You can, when you're nervous, you have a lot of energy and that energy needs to go somewhere. With kids, what they do is they might twiddle their hair. So I always tell my clients, put the hair back. We also notice they speak quite quickly. In an online interview, you can do whatever you want under the desk. That nervous energy just dissipates away, okay? So it works in your favor. The other thing that we interviewers have, now someone like me, I've been trained to give interviews, we have something called unconscious bias. Okay, don't worry about the technical term, I'll, I'll break it down for you. For example, um, if I was doing an online interview, this is very hypothetical, but say someone had a post of Tom Cruise in their background, I might think, hmm, okay, I think I'll give this person a place. Not because I like Tom Cruise, I'm just talking hypothetically that I might start asking easy questions because I might happen to think Tom Cruise is the most amazing actor. So this is an example of bias on the interviewer. Um, another example of bias, if you have an online interview and I see a really messy book, bookcase or I see a bed in the background, it's not made up, again, something called bias might influence my decision about whether I give this person a place. An official interviewer is trained to put away all that but most 11 plus and 13 plus and 16 plus interviewers, interviewers have bias. So why not eliminate all that and have a blank wall behind you? We've taken away everything that could possibly upset the interviewer. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I've, um, I've actually just picked up on a question that someone's asked, which is, about looking into the camera yeah. because it's really hard i'm talking to you right now and yeah. i'm looking slightly to the side yes um how how do we cope with with being online and looking at the camera or indeed getting distracted by the picture of yourself in the corner yeah so this is a really good point and my clients know my hat for this i've got a few hacks that i'm going to share so if you notice i haven't looked away from the camera the whole time i don't know hopefully that's that's the case because what i do and i tell my clients to do is Get a big arrow in the terms of a post-it note and say, look here and stick it on your camera. OK, that will focus your eyes onto that small, tiny camera. OK, it's a very simple trick. Just get an arrow or um, a marker that you can take away later or a little note with an arrow and just say, look here. And that's what you need to do. But if I look at your picture, Gem, on the screen, can you say I've, I've taken my eye contact away? I'm looking at your face. I'm no longer giving the interviewer eye contact. Now, if I look at the camera, I'm looking as though I'm talking to you. So just get that simple arrow and put it there. So again, this favors the interviewer because in a normal setting, we wouldn't have to do this because automatically you would be given eye contact if we were face to face. So you do have to adapt when it's online. So one thing I say, have a clear background, get rid of all that bias. Don't give the interviewer any bad impressions, okay? There are certain things that we've mentioned, like the internet glitch. Yep. Please do a mock run. So I had a um, story today, someone's camera went off right in the middle of the interview. Now, the fact that you know your interview is going to happen at a certain date and a certain time, and that it's online, that gives you a chance to do a mock run. You determine what room you're going to have it in. You determine what's in your background. You determine what you're going to wear. So beforehand, log into Zoom on one account, the parent logs into Zoom on another account, and you do a mock trial, okay? So the sound, the lighting, have a look at all that. Mm -hmm. Now, some things you're not going to understand, like a normal interview. Please don't sit there in silence, okay? Certain things in the interview will still come across. Awkward silences will always be awkward silences. We can't get rid of that, regardless if you're face-to-face -face or online. So I would say, always ask, okay? Don't just sit there twiddling your thumbs, looking around. If you don't understand, ask and ask in a polite way. So I would say, could you rephrase that please? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. This is a normal part of human conversation. Absolutely nothing wrong. And it's something that you do in a classroom. So again, I wouldn't say there's anything wrong with asking for help. 
And that's a sign of a good learner, rather than sitting there in agony, where it's both awkward. Let's talk about dress. Even if it's Saturday or Sunday, I always say wear uniform. You're never gonna get penalized for being overdressed. But again, what I talked about interview bias, if you come with a scruffy appearance, you've already introduced bias to the interviewer. So you've put in the mind that you're not that smart, you might not be taking it seriously. Why give the interviewer all those doubts? Go smart, okay? You can't lose that way. Um, again, I've had a couple of clients where I'm gonna move the camera a bit. Their face is like that, okay? <laughs> That's really annoying. So don't, you know, all these little tricks, sort all these out beforehand. Your face should be in the middle of the screen. You need to see my lips moving, okay? You need to see the facial expressions because I can still give those non-verbal cues. I can still yeah. smile and come across as friendly. I could still look quite bored, you know, not appear very engaged. I can, the interviewer can still get some pieces of information about your personality. I think this, um, your passion, that really comes through. You know, if you were to start talking about something you're interested in, I'm gonna start moving my hands, I'm gonna be, you know, really animated. My eyes are gonna light up, I'm gonna start smiling. I might start talking quickly like I'm doing now because I'm very energetic and enthusiastic. If there's something that I don't really like, I might stop talking like this and go very quiet, or I might look a bit shy, okay? So your personality and your body language does determine the confidence and enthusiasm you have about a subject. And that is important as well for those, those students who don't feel that confident online, because that is exactly how they'll speak if yeah. they aren't pre-prepared or they aren't rehearsed in in that way of speaking online and i'm not saying preparing answers it's the the process because yeah. i get when i get students at the start often they're, they're they're mumbling they might be looking down and and actually they might be talking about something they're interested in but i can't often hear them because yeah. they're mumbling to themselves and 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 it just it's a it's a bad conversation you wouldn't do that necessarily if you were face to face because yeah. you'd probably lift your head up a bit more and so so that's something that i always say you know passion has to shine through in your your whole body and, and your voice as well exactly exactly and i think again the online interview works really well if you were to be in a face-to-face -face interview with three or four um, like a panel interview there are some schools who have two interviewers in the room often the second person is an educational needs specialist um that might be quite intimidating but you know, when I look in the camera, I have no idea who's in front of me. I don't know if any of you, there could be one person listening to this talk, there could be 60, I don't know. And that's the beauty of it. I, if you're nervous in front of people, it doesn't matter if they're three or four with Zoom, it's great. You, you know, you can just block them all out. A good night's sleep, all the stuff we say for normal interviews, you know, follow that, have a good breakfast, have a good night's sleep, wake up refreshed, you might want to shower in the morning, you know, get the blood flow going. Go for a little run, get the oxygen going to the brain, get the endorphins and the adrenaline pumping. You might want to do all of that. Make sure you log in on time. It's like when you go to an interview and you're running late in traffic and you get all flustered. Children will get flustered as well. If they're worried about the internet connection or they haven't come and sat down on time, eliminate those worries. As a parent, take all that stress away and make sure they're set up properly. Um, also, yeah, make sure if you're on a tablet or phone that you're not getting these pings and messages and chats. It's really distracting. In a face-to-face -face interview, you wouldn't dare walk into the room, would you? You wouldn't pick up the phone. So don't do it on an online. So that, I would say that was just common sense. Perfect. For the, um, I suppose for the internet glitch, occasionally it does happen. Yeah. Um, I would also just have a, have a backup. So mm -hmm. if the internet goes down, have a hotspot ready. And, and this is this is what we did with university interviews over over Christmas for Oxbridge. And the other thing is, if if it happens, make sure that your your child can log back in and can say, "I'm really sorry, but the internet had a glitch. Let's get back." And and the interviewer will pick back up. They are they are prepared for that happening. That's not your fault. There's nothing that that can be done with that one. Um, and the same thing if there's there's something there end with streaming and everyone freezes for a little bit, you know, yeah. that, that stuff does happen. Um, it's unfortunate and it does sometimes put students off. So occasionally I will have a conversation about, you know, oh, if it if it doesn't work, then 
this is this is the plan of action we've got so that students know that there is something in the background just in case that uh, that you are around and that you are going to do it I wouldn't wouldn't, uh, wouldn't leave them completely on their own no. um, but uh, but very much wouldn't hover either and uh, and be there I there's actually two questions I think that's uh, that have been asked one of them is is a is is a background with say trophies or certificates better than one that's blank would it give yeah. a an option to to converse converse about it yeah I, I i say this to my clients we had one one child who had like 10 trophies i said well you're not only going to gain you're not going to lose by having them on the background people often don't have that availability you, you might not have a mantelpiece or a ledge to put it on but if you do put them there and you know someone said well is it tacky well if it's tacky so what you're not going to get lose points over it you can only gain so absolutely if you've got a ledge or if you've got a mantelpiece put your trophies put your certificates likewise if you've got badges put those on you know you're never going to lose points over that and also it shows you made an effort you want to show off that's the whole point of an interview so that's a yes for me i, I would put those okay and then uh someone else has also asked uh, i think it's more of a comment actually but um but the idea of kind of silences we mentioned those long silences but for those of you that are, that are concerned about short silences i i very often see children who rush into things mm -hmm. so for me i would always say please first of all let the interviewer finish talking mm -hmm. even if you know what question they're going to ask and then a short pause before you answer makes you sound less prepared because otherwise it sounds like I've heard that question I'm going to recite this piece of the script and therefore as an interview it's just it's it isn't very it hasn't come from their head so so I do to my students I, I'd say you know just a short pause before before answering and if you don't have something to answer then then ask them a, a clarifying question if it's something that's confusing if you can't think they've asked for an example of something you can't think of one just tell them that you're going to think of one so just say i'm going to take a moment to to have a think is that okay yeah. um and they'll always say yes but uh, do do kind of keep that keep that communication going do you agree yeah absolutely and i think that thing about um you know not rushing i think that's really important also that you know when you want to clarify a question I, I do tell my clients just you can use that twice, but no more. You can't keep using that card if you don't understand. So try not to use it too often. It's OK once or twice to ask for help. Yeah. And then if you don't necessarily know, I would say I would always start the, the, the conversation with, well, I'm unsure. However, the however being the really important so that you've always got an answer. Yeah. or a working out for an academic question i'm not certain but could it be yeah so that i'm not certain gives your brain just a little bit of time to catch up and then you can go on with what you think it might be yeah. all right i'm aware that we are oh we're about half an hour in <laughs> <laughs> all right we'll, we'll try we'll try and speed things up a little bit okay that's all right we'll try and get to these here we are presenting the best of you i like this yeah so present the best of us so some of this we've touched on already this is a little thing i've put together remember the word black because i'm into marvels black panther so that's how i remember things with imagery okay so body language we've talked about a little bit already make sure your face is in the you know center of the screen look interested so part of that is sitting upright eye contact not being slouched not looking off all everywhere um lighting is very important and the biggest glare that will give you the worst lighting is a window so to avoid having a window in the background um, avoid a direct bedroom light um, that also gives a horrible glare so again these things you can iron out before the interview we touch on appearance dress smartly girls put your hair back i don't know why that but they do fiddle around with their hair when they're nervous um, communication so that's actually what you say and i think we'll touch a lot a bit about that as we go on to the presentation why have I put kindness here? Well, I think this is the most important attribute I want you guys to try and present. Passion and kindness are those two words that you're going to take away. When you get those moral, ethical questions, for example, um, a child is crying, what will you do? You found £100 on the floor, what are you going to do? Kindness is the key word. Whatever situation they present at you, act as though you're kind, generous person 
because that's what we want. They want these people to come into their school who are kind, who are going to be part of the school community, who are going to go that extra mile for their friend and their colleague and their teacher. So that's why I put this in, do remember kindness. And although it's online, your personality will come through, okay? And I put this in to remind myself, think of your favorite movie character. You know, how, they're not real. They're people that we've seen on a screen, like an online image. But yet, how do we, how, why they are, they're, you know, our favorite is because their personality and their passion comes through. So never forget what you are like will come through on the interview. All right. I don't know, Gemma, if you want to add anything to that. Um, no, I think, I think I'd probably back up in that whilst all different schools have slightly different things that they're looking for. So you know, one might have a particularly great sports team or one might be more focused on their website about science or something. They are all looking for, you know, kind and, and honest and, and you know, communicative and open children. Yeah. Perfect. I'm just going to very quickly click escape because I'm wanting to make sure. Aha, uh -huh, no, we are. We are. I just wanted to check that we were on the presentation the right way. There we are. So these red flags. Yeah. So again, we touched on a little bit of those. So these are the no-nos, okay? The busy background. So, you know, lots going on in the background really deters the interviewer from what you're saying and looking at you. So try and make it clean. Um, neutral colours, don't worry, I don't want you to go painting the walls white or anything. So uh, just kind of clean, uncluttered. Also busy bodies. So, um, you know, I had an had a interview the other day and the mum walked in and the child just lost her train of thought. Happens to the best of us, that's normal. Busy bodies in terms of parents hanging around. You know, I'm not saying you're a bad parent, but sometimes when children think about their parents, a little bit of stress comes in you know your body tenses your jaw clenches your tummy might go a bit funny especially if all you ever do is talk about 11 plus doesn't mean you don't have a great relationship it just brings up some of those feelings yep. so parents I also I also see them sometimes do this oh gosh yes yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and you know it's kind of holding things up or telling them what to say and actually what they're saying is incorrect <laughs> and you know it's a child's personality we want to come through not the adults so, as, and I think Gemma said something really important that, you know, don't be too far away because if there's a technical glitch, you might need to help out, but don't be in their view. I certainly wouldn't be in the same room. So I think that would cause a little bit of a different kind of stress, but, you know, be accessible. You can have the doors open, be in another room. Now, busy bodies can also mean siblings, pets. So again, make sure they're out of sight, out of view and out of sound, okay? Difficult when little ones are running around. So, so really try and again, mentally rehearse what you're going to do with all those factors. Okay, it's really important part of the interview and important for your child, it will make them perform. They don't want to worry about all that kind of stuff. When, when I did an interview session and I said at the end, is there anything you're worried about? And he said, well, you know, my brother always walks into the room. Again, the parent needs to take on that worry. Ask your child, is there anything that I can do? Anything I can make it easier for you? and deal with those, okay? That's not something the child should be worried about and that's something the parent needs to take ownership of. Yeah, I think also if a parent's in the room, a child is more likely to defer to them for an answer. Yeah. So if asked a difficult question that they can't mm -hmm. think of, it's it's almost an instinct to go, but mum, uh, whereas if, they, if you're far enough away to deal with, deal with issues, but at the same time, you know, outside the door, I think someone's put down there, yeah, so I was put down sitting right outside the door that's yeah. useful because you can hear what's happening but yeah. you're also not distracting you're not not getting to the point where a child's gonna going to look off screen and, and you're going to see them try and get get hold of mum because they can't see what they can't they don't know what to say exactly exactly and I think the over rehearsed I think you've kind of touched as well you know not having sentences to rehearse and, and the child's fumbling over what to say Okay, this is my biggest hack of doing an online interview, okay? We know hobbies are gonna get asked, okay? And sometimes a child forgets. So use the online interview to your advantage, okay? I love certain things, okay? So I'm gonna, got my props. I love baking, got my spoon. I love collecting things, I've got candles, love collecting candles. I'm gonna put these on my table, okay? I also love gardening. Gonna put that on my table. 
I'm going to put them just onto view where I can see them. And those are my props for when I get asked about hobbies and interests. Let's say worst comes to worst, unlikely scenario, the interviewer says, you know, can you move your camera around? I want to make sure there's no cheat sheets anywhere. If they see these three things, that is not suspicious at all. If they see flow diagrams and mom and dad's written hobbies one, two and three, that's not going to look very good. And also the child is going like that, trying to read it all. Yep, Visual props are amazing. That's why I say I love online interviews as an interviewee. So put the props in. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, a child, I said, what's your favourite subject? And they said maths. And I said, what do you like in maths? And they, you know, offered themselves, they love sequences. And I said, okay, give me an example of sequence. And then they said uh, triangle of numbers. And then I asked again, we had another go, and, and she couldn't remember. And I said, why don't you get something triangular, put it on your desk? And that worked a treat. Um, in the end, she had a triangle, I think it was like one of those quality street ones, the green ones. And I said, right, your mission is make sure you don't eat it. So you can <laughs> in your interview. And that was it. That's all she needed to do. Yeah. Use your visual props. With mine, they often put them in a bookcase. So bookcase yeah. are the favourite book. Or um, or you can exactly. you can put something that you want to put forward. Often often um, interviewers will ask for sometimes if there's a in face to face interview for you to bring an object yeah. so you can talk about it. And and the same thing I say for for an online interview. If you've got one there, then you can say to them, I really love drawing, and here's something that you know I drew that that I'm really proud of. And you're much easier to talk about. It's much more passionate than trying to describe something that actually isn't your passion. Have it there, have it able to, to be shown. But don't worry about trying to force it into conversation. I think that's that's the other side is where people try and, you know, you ask, what, what's your favourite subject? And they go, but this is the thing I drew. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. It's not it's not quite the right fit. So it's got to be, it's got to be kind of the, the it's got to it's gotta find a balance. Yeah. And I think this is the beauty again of online interviews. You can have that model line around, you can have that art piece line around, you can have that Lego thing that you've made. And, and you know, if it's if they ask and it comes into the conversation, you can show it. Um, favorite books, you know, I might have these on my desk. So got Killing Mockingbird, a bit of Machiavelli, I might put that there. My favorite books. Who's your inspirational hero? Well, if you forget, um, I'm gonna go for Martin Luther King on Malala. So again, that could be on the child's desk, just visual, simple visual props. We're not telling them what to say, we're just giving a few clues. If they forget, if they stumble, have them on your desk. Very simple, but very effective. Yeah, and keep them, keep them limited. So it's not like a whole exactly. load of them, but exactly. uh, very limited, but, but worth, and also worth picking up sometimes. Sometimes yeah. it's nice to show yeah. them. And only if, you're, only if you need them, only if you struggle on those questions, you can have them, so. Okay, lack of interest. I think we've, we've touched on that. You must look engaged. They don't want to have someone in their lesson who's bored. So look engaged, look enthusiastic. And I think listening comes into this, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later, but you must be able to make sure that you've listened to the question. Low voice, we've mentioned, long silences, fibbing. This is one pet hate of all interviewers. So um, we had one client who said um, they really want to come to the school because there's a hockey pitch. Well, actually, the school didn't have a hockey pitch. So either they got confused or um, they hadn't actually seen the school at all. So, uh, or it might be a hobby. You might think, okay, um, yeah, you know, I, I play cricket for a club. And then the interviewer will say, well, you know, what position do you play? Oh, I'm a bowler. And then they'll say, what bowler do you like spin bowling? Or, and then they have no idea what they're talking about. You can catch people out if you're feeling And really, it's not, no need, it's not worth it. And this comes back into believing, the child has to believe and have some certain confidence. They don't need to fit. You just need to describe yourself, the typical things you do, the activities you do. You don't need to make anything up. You're just digging a hole for yourself. And, and it's very easy to get trapped that way, I think. Yeah. And it's also, from an interviewer's point of view, it, for me, if it's over rehearsed or if it seems like it's fit, I will, I will go to some slightly obscure question mm. a lot quicker than if I'm having a conversation about somebody's interest because that's a natural conversation yeah. if somebody is is you know over rehearsed and, and they're reeling off these things that 
that just sound like it's not them and they're, they're even their voice and the way that they're speaking is different then automatically i'll be asking you what would you do with a million pounds because i can't get anything out of that normal conversation so i've got to go to something unusual and yeah. and that's uh that's more stressful for a child yeah all right perfect so we are now at general interviews Oh, somebody has somebody has asked the question, and I'll I'll take this one actually on why in certain schools they need to be parents, <laughs> because this is a very very much a boarding school type question. <laughs> um, typically, a boarding school or a thirteen plus entrance, there will be a for for some of the top ones there are parental interviews. Um, they're not interviews; they're more chats, um, but it is to make sure that you are the type of parent to support your child and to 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 be able to support them in that community it's not a interview as such in that they don't want to know any particular personal details about you but what they will want to do is they will want to chat to you about your life about what you do um, they're not trying to catch you out i know that there are some people who are worried about um, maybe they're a single parent or maybe they're applying for bursary and they're worried about these interviews because they think that, that that's what the interview is for. Mm -hmm. um, the interview is actually just there so that your your child basically to, to put some more context around your child. So they know the background of your child. They know a bit about um, you as parents and, and how you view education and what your view is in terms of fitting with the school's view. So for boarding schools, that is something that um, that, look, that they look at. Um, and, and it is something that, um, that often, the, lots of schools want parents to get involved. So if you have something that you've done, if you're, if you're on a parent teacher association, then by all means talk about that. If you have done a talk in your child's school, then that might be something that's interesting, but they really want to know you know, how are you going to be involved with your child's education and, and with their schooling? Thank you. All right. So I think we've got some uh, some sample questions here, and there's some two really useful websites that you can go to. Um, also, obviously, I have to plug my book, which is on Amazon and uh, Waterstones. So do have a look at that. There's 50 sample questions on there and just some tips as well. Um, are we taking questions, Gemma? Are we going to let people have a go, or are we lack of time here? Um, so there's i've been i've been going through the questions i think and comments but guys if you do have if you have specific questions now would be a great time to drop them down um and let's let's pick a question if you're sitting there with your child um let's have a think which one do you think would be worth just having a chat with your child about should we go for oh let's go for tell me about a lesson that you really enjoyed We'll let them have about a minute. And if you've got a question, pop it down in the comments. If your child is telling you an answer right now, pop that down in the comments as well. And then uh, and then after about a minute, we will we'll have a quick chat about how we would answer that question. So tell me about a lesson that you really enjoyed. What made it so enjoyable? So what would be your answer or your child's answer to that question? What really is the interviewer wanting to know? Right. Oh, thanks, Deep. Deep saying here that we are we're a very useful session. Excellent. That's Good. Nice to hear. I'm glad to hear that one. Perfect. Again, if anyone else has any of those questions, just drop them down to us. Well, thanks, Sabah from Eleven Plus Journey, and I have to thank Gemma for organising this as well. Oh, Sam's got a question as well. Oh. What questions are they likely to ask parents in the parents interview? <laughs> it's usually what they, what you would bring. I think we've covered that one. Um, okay. Oh, someone someone has answered our question. Here we are. Da, da, da. Mavish, I'm getting to your question in a moment because I've got that slightly later down. Okay. Should we have a chat about this question, Gemma? Should I yeah. Answer, or should we wait for answers? Uh, so I think people have probably had a little a little time to think it through and um, and to, to try and have a think about how they would answer it. What would be your tips? Yeah, and I, I think, again, going back to this thing about being truthful, 
it doesn't have to be a highly academic subject okay they just want to try and show what do you like so it could be something really simple it might not be science maths it could be something like geography or rs anything that gets your passion going that you get your enthusiasm going so some i'm thinking my own child experience again we're not making it up i really enjoyed the lessons that had a bit of song element to it like french we might have taught it with some songs i made it really fun and we did it together so again, these aren't trick questions. They're just say what you feel, something that you really did enjoy. It's just a matter of scanning those memories. And I don't think there's any trick other than that. No, I think for me, I'd like to, yeah, if I was answering this, I'd say science. I'm a science teacher. So uh, <laughs> definitely was my favorite stuff at, si at school. Um, but but I'd, also, I'd also have a reason and, and possibly something that I'd done recently in it. So I'd say, you know, my, my favourite lesson is the science because I really like the, the experiments and, and the practicals. Mm -hmm. And then I'd tell them about one that I found interesting. So you know, last, last week when it was icy, um, there was a great one where people were blowing bubbles and they were freezing over. It was really cool to see that the bubbles had frozen. You could see all the little ice crystals in there. So again, you get a little bit of passion, a little bit of story, and um, and it also makes you memorable because there's not going to be anyone else who's talk, talking about frozen bubbles because it's come from you. Yeah, exactly, yeah. All right. Okie dokes. Uh, group interviews. I think we've just about got time. Um, yeah. I'm aware that we're, <laughs> we're, over, we're over time a little bit, but, but we'll yeah. keep going. Okay, group interviews. So, um, you know, again, they want to see the dynamics of how you work with a group. So this could be as a question. So it might be, you know, tell me about a time you worked as a team um, and they might be doing a group interview online. It's, it's very doable as we know some of the schools have already done that. And um, to, it's just like the, as if you're in a real group. So listening skills, um, really listen to what other people are saying because you might use that in your answer. Well, you know, I really liked what Edward said However, I might disagree a little bit. Um, I agree with what Simon said, you know, really showing that you're part of the team, really showing that you'll be really good in a classroom. And it's a balance between expressing too much and standing back. So you wanna be part of the team, you want to be noticed. Now a good interviewer set up, they will go around and they will ask and you won't have to shout out. However, we do know some schools, kids are shouting out. So it really depends how the school structures it. Hopefully, a good interviewer will say, okay, um, you know, Tariq, why don't you tell me your point of view now? I think um, online, Gem, I don't know if you're what your thoughts is. Stand up political online is a little bit trickier. Um, usually, when you're face to face, you might be able to do that. Just make sure that you'll get your point across. Answer the question again, going back to listening skills. Um, what's your favorite hobby? So don't start rambling on about academic subjects. Listen to the question and what's being asked. And then Children, one, one thing they tend to do is when they're nervous, they tend to waffle, know when to stop. And I think that's, a, that's one that. <laughs> you know, know when the, the clock is ticking, you know, so keep your answers concise. And also you have to let the others have a go. So there's a balance between going on and on and on and knowing when to stop and you've answered the question. Um, be prepared to change your mind. Absolutely. It shows that you're teachable. OK, so again, if something with current affairs and moral questions, they might keep pushing and pushing. If you want to stick to your guns, that's fine. But there's nothing wrong with changing your opinion. You don't have to be right. I don't know if anything you want to add, Gemma, about groups. Um, I suppose sometimes with, with the group interviews, I, I think I was the one who wrote Stand Up for the Little Guy, because if there is someone who's not spoken, mm -hmm. um, you can often, again, show that kindness mm -hmm. by by just pointing out that we haven't heard from Edward over here and, and, uh, and maybe he's got something to say. Mm -hmm. So I know that there's been points where I've watched... I've watched group interviews and there's been some really strong characters, but the ones that I've gone away liking the most are the ones that have stood up for others. Um, and also that it, sometimes there's a, there's a group task where you have to uh, pick five items to, to keep on a desert island or you know, decide how to spend a certain amount of money. Um, they're often timed tasks. And although the interviewer will let you know, Mm -hmm. um they often won't let you know until about 30 seconds beforehand mm -hmm. so if you're the person going guys i think we need to move on a little bit you again you will you will show that you have something to offer but without overpowering the group all right okay. i think we've talked about listening so we'll skip this one right Perfect. i'm gonna 
give everything I know about COVID in five minutes. <laughs> Go. <laughs> I'm going to give the best press conference that Boris can't even give. Okay. So, um, listen, you don't have to know about COVID, but it can come up. And if you can talk about it, it's going to be great. So I've put together a very simple guide. Now, you know, some people's families, you might have had a really bad experience. You might have had a loved one or someone who's really ill. Then you don't have to talk about it. It comes up in a question, what have you read in the news recently? They're not specifically going to say, tell me about COVID. So it's an opportunity to show off your knowledge. What have you read in the, t you know, in the newspaper? What have you seen on TV? And then you can use COVID. Now, COVID has affected everyone. So this is one of the reasons why I chose it, because we're all online schooling, we're all in lockdown, so we can't get away from it. So I'm going to do a quick synopsis. Can I have the next slide, please, Gemma? Yes. Right. Three quick facts, okay? This is a new type of virus. We call the technical term SARS-CoV-2, and it was found in 2019. Now, uh, people think it's called COVID-19 because of the year it was discovered, and that's not true. It's a type of virus. I didn't um, yeah, it's not, it's not <laughs> COVID-19 because it was discovered in 2019. Um, so what happened in Wuhan, China, they said a lot of people had started having chest infections, and the technical term is pneumonia. And they... They didn't know why and they didn't know how why people were falling sick all the time and in the end the scientists discovered there was this new virus and they usually noticed it in mammals birds and reptiles uh, 11th of march 2020 a very important date the world health, health organization declared a pandemic a worldwide pandemic so what does covid cause well mainly respiratory symptoms okay it affects what we mean by that is it affects the lungs so coughing is very common um, we also get problems with breathing, and this is why um, we're so worried about it, because the elderly and people who have existing medical problems, they can get really in one and struggle to breathe. And you might have heard in the news people running out of oxygen, um, and that's a real cause of concern, which is why they're trying to get the numbers low. Also affects your smell and taste, and you might have been in this situation, uh, that's okay, if you get any problems or alter smell or taste or a cough, you have to isolate. So simple symptoms, very much like the flu, but can be deadly in certain groups. And the next one. Right, don't worry about learning these times. I just put this in for fun, just put for a bit of reference. Look how roller coaster ride we've been on. So it all started in March. We went on a lockdown. And then Boris said, OK, local lockdowns. And then there was a relaxation of lockdown. And then we went into a lockdown for a <laughs> second one. And then we had four tier restrictions. <laughs> exactly. And I just thought, this is crazy. It's so much just looking at it. Look what we've all been through. And we're back in lockdown again. Phew. So COVID affects everybody. That's all I want to take you from that. Life has changed. Look at the new words we've come across. It's coming up everyday language. Social distancing, pandemic, lockdown. I, I read someone that was a key word in the Collins Dictionary. These are all new words that become everyday. Social distancing, masks, washing hands, that's our new normal. You know, when I see photos of me in groups with my friends, that just seems abnormal now. So again, you might get an interview question. How has life changed in lockdown? What did you do over lockdown? What have you learned? And again, not trick questions. You know, I really appreciate the concept of family or the concept of meeting my friends. These are all things that could come up in your interview. Yep. Slide. I also, I know schools have asked sometimes, you know, what is your school doing? Yeah. Um, or how are you learning at the moment? So yeah. those types of things, it comes up yeah. to as well. Okay, so treatment of corona, there is no cure. Okay, we don't have a cure at the moment. But we've decided there is an exit strategy. There is a way out and vaccines, as well as all the other things that you're doing, like staying at home, wearing masks, social distancing, these are our ways out. Now the vaccine, there's three at the moment on the market. What it does, it teaches the body to fight the infection and it stops you catching coronavirus and it stops you becoming seriously ill. So vaccines are really big in the news at the moment. And if we have the next slide, there's three that's been approved in the UK. And I've just summarized this very simply in a way that your child can understand, okay? Don't worry about how the vaccines work. You're not gonna know that. No teacher will know that yet either, but I put it in there in case you're really fascinated. The main thing is just know that there are three. If you want to know the names, that's a bit of bonus point. Moderna, Oxford, and Pfizer. 
if I wanted to know about more, I would go for Pfizer because I guarantee you the person who invented Pfizer, um, he's going to get the Nobel Peace Prize. OK, if he doesn't, I'm going to eat Gemma's hat. <laughs> <laughs> I know this guy's going to. So very important key discovery in 20, 30 years of time. They're going to talk about this moment. OK, it's such a big moment that we have this vaccine. The Pfizer one is about 95% effective, two doses, three weeks apart. That actually has changed to 12 weeks. There's a lot of controversy because the UK government is following something that Pfizer did not do themselves, okay? So a little bit of a, a, a concern around that. The problem with the Pfizer one, it has to be stored at minus 70. So they're really worried that countries like Africa, who don't have these expensive fridges and can't transport them, aren't going to benefit from this, virus, from this vaccine. However, the Oxford one, it can be like a fridge, like your normal fridge, we can store it. So people like in the developing countries can really access this, this vaccine. And the Moderna one just recently been approved, 94.5% effective, very much works in the same way as Pfizer. So those are the three vaccines in a nutshell. I think- well, like I'm learning a lot here. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the reason why I put this in because UK has broken the boundaries worldwide. It was the first country to be approved uh, of the Pfizer vaccine. We were the world's envy and people started saying, oh, no, no, they're just showing off. We have to show off. This is a landmark. And I think kids should know this. You kids are part of history, OK, as we speak. This vaccine that's been developed is a monumental occasion. And you've, you've witnessed it. Nine year old Margaret Keenan throwing a fact. She was the first person in the world to receive a vaccine, a British citizen. OK, so I love these facts. If you can put them in, learn them, I think it will look great. Okay, you can see I'm very passionate about COVID. <laughs> okay, how could COVID be incorporated in an interview? It could come up in various ways. You don't have to mention it, but if you do, then it's great. It shows that you're up to date with the news. It could be something personal they ask you, like how has lockdown affected you? Um, what have you read in the news recently? It could come up that way. Ethical moral questions. Should we force people to have a vaccine? Again, there's no right or wrong answer. And you know, you could say, I can see why and I can see not why. And that's something could come up as a group interview. That's something that's those debates have come up before previously exactly. in groups. Exactly. And I think a little bit of understanding about COVID would be good in that case. Um, it could be something that's a challenging, you know, you could think of a new game to play in lockdown, explain to the interviewer the rules and any equipment you need. You know, it can come up in all sorts of ways. So I thought I'd just do a quick synopsis of, of what COVID was. I think that's it. Should we have a look okay no yeah um go out there's a lovely book um uh he's a famous author what did you write graffalo that was it he's um put to illustrate this book so do go and get it if you want to know it's lovely for kids i've also got another video on my facebook page about corona about virus so have a look at that and i think on the menu tab of my facebook page there's a little sheet about covid as well very simple great for kids to digest all great stuff to go and check out perfect thanks so much all right, so I am going to just have another look through. No, I think we're good. I think we've got a couple of questions that have been asked. Okay. Um, actually, they're both they're both ones I'm just about to get onto. Actually, so <laughs> probably should just keep going. And um, do keep writing your questions down in down in the comments. Uh, we are looking. We're pulling some of them out. And um, as I said, some of them are just coming up. So. This is one thing that I wanted to share. I've mentioned it briefly before, the idea of telling a story. We've, we've said before, be honest, be kind, be passionate, be positive. But this no one word answers is, is a really big thing for me. If somebody says, what's your favorite subject? Don't just tell me IT, tell me why. Tell me something you did. Tell me the first time you found it interesting. Tell me what you and your friends do in your spare time around that subject. Just tell me a story around it. Um, so I was I was interviewing a student uh, a couple of days ago and uh, we were discussing subjects and we were discussing art and um, we were talking about he said, he said yeah, I, I'm not I'm not the world's best artist and um, and I, I'm not it's not not one of my top top enjoyable subjects. I said okay you know let's, let's talk about why and he told me this great story about when he drew an elephant and he said it was going really, really well until I came to draw the tusks and then it looked a bit crooked. And I thought, I'm gonna remember you because you're the crooked elephant boy. And therefore I exactly know your story. And it made me smile. It gave me so much of an insight into someone's personality 
rather than a standard pre-prepared answer. That idea of putting a story into something and, and really telling me honestly, like it, it was something that really came from the heart and it's something that it made me chuckle and it meant that, that I can really see, okay, you know what? I can't, probably couldn't draw an elephant. I probably get the tusks wrong. And I can see why that means that, or why that might play into why art isn't necessarily your favorite subject if you enjoy coming top. So just give us a little story. A story is always uh, a good thing to, to pop in. Um, and if you're preparing with your, with your child, do run through those oh, remember when type stories. So I wouldn't prepare them and sit down and say, remember this story, but it would be something I'd have a conversation over the dinner table or over question books. And um, if they've got a story about being made captain of the cricket team um, or a game that they played particularly well or, or a way that they you know shone, just remind them of that. And, um, and, and, and make sure that they then, they, they're familiar with that story. So that if that question comes up, they can, uh, they can then go, oh yeah, that was the, the, the type of story. That was a, a way to be able to tell the, uh, the interviewer a little bit about you. All right, a couple of these have already been asked. Here we are. Um, and I know that this has come up in the comments. So have you, apologies, have you applied to other schools? Of course you have. It, it would be unusual to be year six and not have applied to other schools or not have looked around other schools. So don't tell them no, because of course you have. It, it, would, it, would, it just seems a bit strange that you'd say no, but do say why this one would be the one you'd like to go to. So I always say, if you're asked, regardless of when it is, a 13 plus or an 11 plus, do say yes. Yes, I've looked at other schools. However, I'd really love to go to this one because, or because, because of this reason, this one's my top choice. So give me a reason why this one is, is of interest to you, but do be honest. Um, picture tasks. So occasionally, it typically is, again, more boarding school independence, more 13 plus, but it has been known to come up in 11 plus. And in fact, I think it is coming up in 11 plus. Um, St Paul's, I think, has said that they're doing a picture from memory. Um, picture tasks are often where you are given a picture and then you could be asked you know, what you think of it. Very open. You're never going to be asked who painted it. People always seem to think there's a, it's like this, this art part that they don't know the answer to. There, there is no answer. They want you to be able to talk. So if someone gave me that, I would be saying, okay, well, it looks a bit like there's lots of swirls in the background and maybe maybe there's an alien ship and it's landed, it's landed in the sea. And all these different things. I'd, I'd, be, I'd be talking about the colours and maybe how I liked... Uh, I liked the swirls and I liked the fact that there was blue and red, but I wouldn't be telling you who wrote, who drew it, because I don't know where, who drew it at all. And I won't be telling you what the subject is because I think there might be houses, but I don't really know. So that hopefully deals with the picture one. Um, the unusual questions. So somebody here has written, you know, what would you do if you were invisible for a day? Those types of questions. Again, there's no right answer. Um, if I borrowed a million pounds, would I be a millionaire? They want to see you and your thoughts. And as a child, you and your thoughts. Um, and, and for you to be able to explain your thoughts. So, you know, what would you do if you were invisible for a day has a has, has a number of different answers depending on who you are but be able to justify it. As the Fraser said, be kind with it and be honest with it. So you wouldn't want to say, I'd go and I'd rob a bank because it's probably not something that you'd want to do and probably something you wouldn't really do if you were invisible. But, um, but do, do tell us, you know, and what, what would you do when you're invisible? Maybe I'd, I don't know. And I spend a moment thinking about it. And I go, oh, okay, well, maybe I would, I would play a joke on my friends. 
because we're always playing practical jokes on each other. And that way they get a little bit of idea about your personality. Um, the question of, here we are. Yep, again, I think someone has asked about, yeah, what, what questions should you ask the school at, at the end? And they do often give you that chance, um, almost always give you that chance. And I would always ask something you can't find out on the website. So, because if you ask something you can find on the website, you might as well have done it. And for some of my 13 plus students, I will get them to go through the website. I will get them to a point where they know what's on the website and then say, well, what would be your next question? So then you can say, well, I looked on your website and I saw that you have a hockey club and you've got a trampolining club and you've also got a tennis club. And I'd be interested in all of those three clubs. So can you tell me whether they all run at the same time? Or you know, can you tell me how many clubs I can take in year seven? Because it shows you've put the effort in, you've gone away, you've spent that time on their website, you've got that information, and then you come up with a question. And yes, you've thought ahead. Of course you have, because you've prepared for the interview. So that might be something to consider having a look through if you haven't already done so. Um, okay, we're getting there. Uh, tell me an example of is a, a type of question. Tell me an example of when you have led a team, when you have come across problems at school or when you have um, struggled with something. Um, actually struggling to think of them, but, but, <laughs> but tell me an example of a fairly standard. Um, I recommend the STAR technique, um, which is the situation. So what kind of thing were you doing? The task, what did you have to do within that? The action, what did you take? But also what the action of the whole group was, if you're doing like a leadership and the results. And I wouldn't say those words, but I would use that to structure my answer. So if somebody asked me, tell me an example of when you have been a leader, I would say, well, okay, at my, at my Brownie unit, um, there was a overnight camp and we had to put up a tent and um, we, we needed to put the tent up in the next hour, but there was a group of six of us and only two of us had ever put a tent up before. So what we did was I took charge and I read out all the instructions and there were groups, the pairs of two people who were doing individual tasks. And then once we put everything together, um, we came back together and we assembled the whole tent and we got it done within 40 minutes and we had 20 minutes to go to a campfire and go and eat s'mores. So then I would use that situation task action results to be able to organize my thoughts. And then there's just some, some kind of unusual questions um, like, like the foreign country one as well. Okay. Fraser, <laughs> gone over. We've gone over in time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are we okay to keep going or have we got to stop? I'm, I'm okay, Saba, I don't know if she wants to. Okay, okay, are we good to go? Are we good to continue? Should, should I think we, we're going should to just go for it until they just chuck us off. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> okay, so for some of you who have academic interviews coming up or you're looking for an academic scholarship, you may have an academic question coming up or you may have been told you can have some maths and English. Um, don't phrase it as a chance for an interviewer to test you. It is a chance for you to show your skills. Very much a different change. So a lot of students get very worried about these tests because of these, these interviews, because they're not tests. Um, but, but in terms of rephrasing it, it's a chance for you to show off. It's a chance for you to show what you can do and to, to really shine. So as I put down here, there's so many categories at which you may have um, you, you may have ended up doing some academic questions. So if you've done, I said pre-test, but there's a second stage and that second stage involves interviewing, they may give you academic questions. If you have been told you're doing an academic interview, so you've been told that there will be math and English or general questions within there. 
Um, if you have been told that you are doing an academic scholarship and you've taken the pretest, or if you have um, you are applying for a scholarship and you've not been told, they might just throw them in. So it is worth knowing that uh, the kind of style of it and uh, and how it how it works. So I've got a little bit. Oh, it's very blurry, but that's okay. Um, a, a little bit of, of example on how it may be structured or how it's how it's looking. So over on the left hand side of the page, left hand side, um, there is a poem. It's uh, The Night Mail. It's one of my favourite poems and it's one I like to give out for uh, practice interviews. And the reason that I like this poem is it's not obvious of what, what you're writing about. So it allows me to be able to get the student to read through. And sometimes they'll read through on their own. Sometimes they'll be asked to read aloud. Sometimes I have known this being a poem of discussion. So a group version. Um, it's unlikely to be nowadays online, but if you are watching this on replay and you've got a, uh, an, a group interview coming up and they've said that it might be some academic questions. I have known this come up as a, as a group academic um, question, what do you think the poem's about? And what I'm looking for is I am looking for students to pull out certain phrases. So most students will pull out night mail. Okay, well maybe it's a postman. And then we can see the letters, letters for the rich, letters for the poor, that makes sense. But the problem that we get is, well, it says her, so maybe it's a post woman. Gradients against her, but she's on time. And then we get to shoveling white steam over her shoulder. And um, I've had lots of interesting explanations um, about people, post women, swimming their way through fog, often, um, with this one. Um, and then the next line, snorting noisily as she passes. So we get a noisy post woman. And at this point, often, students may need to go back and look at their original assumptions because it turns out it's not a post woman. Um, I'm not going to tell you what it's all about. I'm going to let you uh, let you and, and any students who are listening work it out, um, but it is not a post woman. So the types of things that could be asked, you could be asked, you know, what do you think that poem's about? Uh, you could be asked, why do you think the author uses this specific word? So why would they say wind bent grasses? Why don't you say bent grasses? Um, if you're looking at a creative piece, you might be asked, how does the author bring tension? Or how does the author show that the character is excited? Or you might just be asked what might happen next? Or to find an example of a literary technique and tell me why it's interesting. And that's something that normally in a written piece, you would, you would be asked a similar type of question, but you'd be given certain lines and said to find a literary technique, or you might be asked, what technique is this? So all we're doing is we're now asking it verbally. It's no different to anything that's been prepared for. So this uh, night mail, the night mail poem, I've come across in, in English 13 pluses. I've come across in 11 pluses as well, actually, um, but written. So it's just a, it's a different way of asking. I know that uh, there is a school, I can't remember off the top of my head, there is definitely one that is asking people, um, people to, to do a piece of writing at the, at the, um, during their interview. There are some short online tests that are being given alongside interviews. Um, but when you're doing this discursive, this idea of academic um, interview, they're not just going to give you the question and leave you. It's gonna be a discussion. So if someone said to me, if I said, said to a student, what do you think that poem's about? And they told me post woman. I said, okay, well, tell me, tell me how you know that. And they might give me some examples. And then I'd put to them, well, actually, what about this one? Stares from the bushes at her blank faced coaches. What's, what's that really mean? And then I'd wait for them to try and work it out for me. So the role of an interviewer at this point is to guide a student and to, to develop their knowledge and to develop their analysis. 
so they won't leave your child to to just work it out um they will probe they will try and try and ask well why do you think that um if they need to ideally your child will be telling them i can tell it's a postwoman because or i can tell it's this because um but if not they'll be asked why and someone has asked to me is it bad if a child gets it wrong and then changes their mind definitely not no because if you read the first four lines of this poem very much sounds like it could be a post woman but as we go through we get to that last line it seems like it might not be quite as much so absolutely fine and it's a real thing to to practice with a with an academic interview is to 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 practice speaking your ideas out loud it's something that people struggle with so that idea of of we're very used to reading writing not necessarily discussing and um and if you are preparing the next couple of days you're preparing for an academic interview you're wanting to try and bring out a why don't you think this or why do you think that and why is this interesting and very much you, your child can be speaking out loud as they work things out. And, and that's what I'll go on to with the math as well. Um, so with the math examples, um, you, you've got a choice. You kind of got multi-step questions or, or slightly shorter questions. So I've got a multi-step one and then I've got those two shorter versions. Um, with the multi-step, I get used to, to speaking out loud. Um, just, just like a phrase I said at the start with um, keeping things around, um, then the I would I would also keep some paper nearby if you know you've got an academic interview, so that you can say to them, "Is it okay if I write down my calculations?" They might say no, but you you can ask. You know, you, some some. It depends very much depends on the question, depends on the interviewer sometimes. Um, so so always ask if you think that it's something that is worth writing down. So for example, this multi-step, I'd struggle to do it unless I wrote it down. So again, get used to speaking out loud. So it's a lot more about um it's, it's a lot more about your method when it comes to math um than the answer often. So I got 30% 30, 30 on a 10 problem test. Okay, so if there was 10 problems, that would mean three of them are correct. And you go through and you talk out your answer that they can see what you are doing. So that is something that's a little bit trickier. Um, and I think some, some students who are used to writing it down just have, need to have a little bit of a practice on, um, on writing out those, those longer um, multi-step questions and really talking them out. With the shorter stuff, again, what's the difference between volume and area? What's the product of this? They're often looking to see key skills. So these are often where you would have had an exam and then it's been replaced um, with an interview and they want to see, do you know these types of terminology? So product. So if you said to somebody, okay, what's, a, what's the product of 12 and five? I, I, as an interviewer be hoping that they say okay product means or that they'd be doing that sum and they'd be saying it out loud so that i can hear what they're doing because then i know exactly what's happening i'm getting that verbal feedback as well as anything that they might be writing down or that they might be showing me so with those english and those maths examples the big is talking and we're moving quite quickly for some people who are doing an online um who are doing an online uh interview now if you're if you're looking from moving from from doing a test to doing something that's academic you are needing to practice that speaking out loud because they're used to doing it on paper okay i think we're done i think we're done <laughs> hopefully everybody has um has not minded us being too long sorry guys I will they can always replay it if they have to off, so <laughs> exactly perfect and of, of course i want to say a really big thanks to uh 11 plus jenny for letting us come on and let me back on again um and also for fraser to come along and give us your expertise 
uh, thank you guys because I know that this has been really helpful to our members and um, yeah and it, it, it seems like people have gotten a lot out of it so thank you thank you all right so if you do have questions or you're watching this on catch up and um, we will be in the comments um, answering any comments um, going through and, and making sure if, if anybody does um, does have extra questions then please uh, please do ask them in the comments um, if you do have specific stuff um, ask on this group 11 plus journey is is here to help we are here to help you as much as we can um, if you're watching this on replay you want some more in-depth advice uh, for us a book and is it where, where is it available tell us um, <laughs> Waterstones and Amazon. Waterstones and Amazon. There we are. That's where to get it from. Um, and then obviously, if you're looking for any one-to-one -one practice or anything specific, then I'm right in thinking both of us run one-to-one -one practices and uh, I've stuck the emails there. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much for guys who have been listening. Thank you, Saba, for letting us on Life and Plus journey. I'm sorry it took so long. Thanks to Frozen for, for putting up with me. <laughs> and, uh, Thank you. I was the wingman. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, guys, for uh, for tuning in. Brilliant. All right, then. Thank you very much. Bye.